just going to start off with carpeted bathrooms. <laughs> because my father was in the rug business. So I grew up with carpeted bathrooms. I love that. I like what's with- what what's wrong? What, I like I have to say I'm a little like <laughs> uh, like I I I don't get why it's such a weird thing, but it's I weird. love that. It's is weird. it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. But wait, it gets better. We had carpeted bathroom, carpeted kitchen. Oh. Carpeted uh, trunk of the car. Hmm. My father, you know, we were like these poor families. So we got free carpeting. So you did what you did and you just you carpeted, carpeted everywhere. Everything. I like that. <laughs> but it's amazing how you just. You know, a photo, a video of you in a carpeted bathroom turns into international headline news. Which is so bizarre. I mean, I do live in the mountains where it gets freezing in the winter. I have a bathroom that has like tile all the way around it. So it's not like we're stepping on on carpet wet. But it is so funny that it became such a, I don't know, I, I literally thought, how is nobody actually commenting on my miniature sofa? <laughs> the idea, like, I put brought all of that in there. It's not like that was in my bathroom. <laughs> right. It was all about what was the best sound. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything else around it is all the things that make me laugh. Can a carpeted bathroom be erotic? Um, look, if we put a rug down, what's the difference? I think a carpeted bathroom would be much more erotic than having sex on cold tile. Exactly. Floor. Yeah. Good point. Really good point. Okay. So that, that, there's the marketing for uh, bathroom uh, rugs. And I can say it, it has served. Great. It, it has served wow. that, that particular wow. bathroom. You, you went there. You <laughs> went there. I'm just bringing up my childhood. Uh. (laughs) So I have to say, so I'm listening to it last night, right? And my husband's in the other room and it's all like, I'm not listening with you. And I felt like this little kid. I felt like when I was 12 and I listened to Dr. Ruth, Ah. (laughs) like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm listening to this. I make erotica for women. Erotic confessions. I record women's fantasies. You're really testing the limits, aren't you? Dream a little dream of me. All right, we're recording. It's really good. Like, I don't, I think this is the first narrative podcast that I've listened to. Oh, really? Oh, that's okay. so yes. great. And I am totally. Totally into it. They sent me some of the scripts to look at because obviously not all the episodes, but I don't want to look at the scripts. Okay. Because I want to know what's going to happen. Yeah. So yeah, that's so great. It's really, um, it's fascinating. It's, I'd also, I start imagining like old school radio shows, like Demi is sitting in her bathroom with shoes on like wood <laughs> to make, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So well, there sure. there were there were actually mm-hmm. a couple of moments where, where we did add in our own effects. Demi was kissing into her elbow. <laughs> like we did have to point. do some yeah. things like that. Yes, or even I think the teeth brushing, yeah. or you know things that we did. That's hilarious. But so, I have to sure. say, like your the smile on your face right now is why I think we want to do this show because it's such a wonderful, delicious smile. And I just love that you found the time to just enjoy it on your own. It's so great. And I'm a gay guy. And I'm wow. it. Even and better. I'm awesome. But you know, it's, I think one of the things that, sh- that, that Shauna brought in this is that it's really, it's rich in texture vibes that are going on. It's not just, you know, the erotic confessions unto themselves. Right. It's the layers of, you know, how we hold that and how we hide that and and just what's happening in this in this person's life who is carrying on secrets upon secrets and that's what it's always the secrets that's yes. you know <laughs> secrets that will kill us yes. um so shauna you sit down with your husband 
Brian Kavanaugh Jones. Oh, uh, great. Producer. He'll love that, that you're saying his name. <laughs> yes. Hey, <laughs> variety. It's variety. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you sit down with him. Do you say you want to do this? Do you write the script first? How do you, I guess, break the news to him that this is what you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, he has the curse of being married to a writer. I feel like it's like, (laughs) you know, being married to Taylor Swift or something. Like, eventually, it's all just going to come out. (laughs) Um, But it was an incredibly, like, emotional, profound time in our life. Like, we almost lost each other. There was a time, it was 10 years ago, where we were strangers and we stopped having sex altogether. And... I think both of us thought in our heads, there is no way we will possibly find our way back. No way. It's impossible. I had a boyfriend. He had a girlfriend. We were living in other, you know, with other people. And the one thing that happened is that we would meet because we still shared animals together because I'm a huge animal person. And so we would meet and kind of either, you know, share the animal or drop off one animal and pick the other up. And every time we would meet, we would cry. And that was at every restaurant. We would just cry. And, and then he did something so unbelievably touching that I was just like, what did I do? What did I do? And through like a year of therapy and talking about things that I never was raised to talk about. I was not raised to talk about sex openly. I, was, I had so much shame about my own sexuality that I was fighting through. And of course that's going to come through in your marriage. It has to. Um, And so when I told him that I was going to do this, it just, it has too much of a happy ending. We have three kids, you know, we're happily married. Happy ending. Sorry. Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we could go all day with that. And so I wanted to show a marriage coming back together. I wanted to show how you could start at that place and find your way back to each other. And look, that's, it's not going to happen in one season. That's a few seasons of work. Right. And Brian was completely supportive. Because but, I think- but it isn't something you see. Yeah. You don't see you, see, you see the breakdown, demise, destruction. You don't see it starting from that place and rebuilding when on paper it shouldn't. Mm. You know, like yeah. they defied logic. Mm-hmm. Was there a point where Brian was like, don't you, don't you dare put that in there. Don't, no, you can, no, that is off limits. I can't imagine what it would be, but. (laughs) No, I mean, I'm pretty open in the podcast. And look, I am a writer. I am not Diana. You know, like we had fun. We took liberties, but there were definitely times in the episode where Brian was like, is that what I was really like? Did I sound like that? Is that, that feels Did you say he like came by walking by a few times and was like, ooh. Wow, I, I've forgotten about that. Like, or, Did I sound that pathetic? <laughs> I was like, no. I mean, it's there's there's some hyperbole here, but yeah, we were in a really bad time, and I wanted to write about that as honestly as I could. Because I think the um, the scene where Diana's with her girlfriends at the restaurant, yeah. and she says, "He said please." <laughs> that like I didn't even realize how. Uh, let me explain. He said they were in bed. He wanted to have sex. Diana didn't want to have sex. Oliver, her husband, says, please. That oh. is, oh. It's cringy, right? Oh. It's cringy. Yeah. Just hearing you say it back, <laughs> oh, it makes me feel even worse. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. like, oh. Oh, Diana says some really awful things. <laughs> I know. Oh. You were yeah, worried I, about it. I yeah. was worried. Why? Yeah. Why? I think it's just the part that is very different than me and how I respond and, you know, I, and um, I think I tend to look at things, it, it say in my own life as being completely the opposite, overly careful, overly, you know, analytical, thinking through, sen- like trying to be sensitive and um, it, not that that's always good. Sometimes you just need to be able to like say it. So I, right. I, I, you know, it felt harsh. So it took Mm. on a harsher um, feeling or tone for me. Mm. What did you learn about yourself? Ooh. Well, it's still in motion. But I think, um, you know, one of the great opportunities doing what we do is being able to 
use things to help push you um, beyond where you are resting. And in this case, you know, I realized that there's a part for me that my sexuality has felt like it's a dangerous, dangerous, and that I should just keep it under wraps, that I should keep it shut down. And it's better to just not negotiate or, and like take it off the table. And I think this has been an incredible opportunity of opening into areas that I'm not comfortable with. Mm. And that unto itself is already a gift. Shauna, why, why a podcast? Why not a limited series on Hulu or? Well, uh, look, I hope it's a limited series on Hulu one day, you know? Um, But I think podcasts, it just gives you permission. Like I always say, it's like the Rosemary baby rule, you know, the baby in your head is so much scarier than the little, you know, red eyed baby at the end of the movie that they (laughs) so wisely did not shoot. And I think, you know, the fantasy and the sex in your head is just going to, it allows you to use your imagination and the imagination is a powerful thing. And so I feel like I was so lucky to get someone like Demi, who I think people have a trust in, you know, they trust her brand and they, when they know that she's involved They might go on a journey that they might not normally go on because it is her leading us, you know? And so, um, well, the great thing is, is right now also like the, the, the demand for podcasts, Mm -hmm. um, uh, is so great. And so we're also delivering something that in in a, in a space that's really hungry for it, Mm. but it also gave us, a, a place to explore at a lower risk mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. At, you know, to kind of explore where we want to go and, and what to do with it. Um, and, and in all honesty, to get feedback, like this is like what better platform to kind of go down, really also see what is it that people are wanting or needing that we can. Mm. So if it were to go to Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, HBO, <laughs> any of those are you um, listening <laughs> that um w- will already be a step ahead in terms of you know what we might want to do with it was to me the first person well not that you're going to tell me she was the second person but i could was, have been and that's okay <laughs> but it's it's even just wh- hearing the first episode i'm like oh it has to be the yeah. voice being yeah. dirty diana whose yeah. other yeah. voice could it be No, she has the most iconic voice in the business. Are you okay, Diana? It was supposed to be funny. I think it's funny. Okay. It looks like y'all need these more than me. Bottoms (laughs) up, ladies. Thank you, Eric. (laughs) No, no, no. It it is funny. But maybe she just doesn't want everyone to know. Or Uh, maybe she's reeling from her divorce. Okay, Diana. Please please don't make this into a big deal because it's not. When you do a podcast, you realize how special it is to have a recognizable voice because there are some actors that you know and you love their work, but when they're in the podcast space, people are like, who is that? Oh, is that, oh, is that so, no, oh, it must be so-and-so. And you're like, what a gift to have an iconic voice where everyone, the minute they hear her is like, oh, Demi Moore's in this? Okay, great, you know? Except what's so strange, because for all of us, I, I, it's it's so like nails on a chalkboard to hear your voice, oh, like, yeah. and yeah, even, yeah. and so I'm grateful that it somehow like other people see something because when I'm hearing it, I'm like, oh god, do I sound the most boring? Am I the most uninteresting? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's you, definitely painful. Do you remember the first time someone said to you, "You have such a sexy voice"? Oh, definitely. Because, you know, one of my first jobs as a young girl, still even in high school, was that I worked for a collection agency. And I had to make calls (laughs) for people whose bills were past due. So like, and that's when I was like 14, 15. And so I, I, you know, people had already been commenting, you know, way back. Is it strange at 14 years old hearing that? 
It is because <laughs> I don't really know exactly. I mean, I it's like I knew that my voice was maybe a little lower. I, right. I of course, didn't think of it as sexy or have any context for that. You know, I thought because I had been a cheerleader for a short while, which is part of where that came from, um, from, you know, screaming out cheers. <laughs> and I think it is somewhat um, hereditary. But, and probably those Marlboro Reds that I was smoking as a teenager didn't hurt, didn't, uh, didn't hurt. Oh, Marlboro Reds. Because <laughs> oh. I actually, I actually think that my voice is, is, is not as low now. When I hear um. things from when I first um, was starting out, my voice is actually much lower then. Wow. So tell me about the first time you start recording this. It's like, okay, like, First of all, you're doing this all via Zoom, so no one's together, right? So you're doing orgasms. Like, are you having the orgasms together on Zoom or are they taped separately? No. Well, the interesting thing is, is I was, I told all the actors, I said, you know what? If you want to record all of that and just send us the noises later, the F, I was calling them efforts. You know, if you want to send it, <laughs> totally do that. You can just record them on your own time, send them over later. And every actor was like, no, I want to do it in the scene. I mean, I think that's the great thing about Andrea Riseborough in the first episode. She said, I it's the her. reason I signed up to get have an orgasm with Demi Moore. Like, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so she was just so brave. And we were just talking about, you know, as a director, how do you, how do you direct an orgasm? And what I learned is don't direct an orgasm. Because what women have been trained to hear from pornography is one way to have an orgasm, right? And that is, you know, the first thing you hear in these movies that all the orgasms sound exactly the same. And so as a teenage girl, you hear that and you think, okay, well, that's what I have to sound like. And so when I'm, you know, having sex with my first boyfriend and I'm going to fake my first orgasm, which everyone does, I'm going to sound exactly like that. And you just do that imitation. And then somehow that becomes a patented orgasm sound. It's just, right. it's ridiculous. And then what I love about the opportunity to work in this space is we can, you know, debunk that myth and show that there's a lot of different sounds that people make and they're real sounds when they're having an orgasm. Because that's what takes me out of porn pornography is as a director, I'm like, I don't believe anything that just happened. That performance was so manufactured. <laughs> this plot line was horrible. I don't like the white walls you guys are shooting against. <laughs> like, what is that wardrobe, that, that linen bed cover? I mean, is it, I just, they're, I'm picking apart everything, right? Yeah, this, the same room is the locker room, the dentist's office, the boss's <laughs> office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and those are the storylines, you know, and they're like, but we have a little story for you in this one. And you're like, who wrote it? Yeah, I'm not on board. No. <laughs> Yeah. What what is the difference between pornography and erotica? Hmm. Hmm. Is there an actual definition? I wonder. I haven't looked it up. But I think. Hmm. Ooh, good question. I mean, just in the way that I've been thinking about it in my head, is that pornography for me feels more like a male gaze, right? And mm -hmm. and, and manufactured. Mm -hmm. It feels very manufactured. Where erotica feels. Uh, more authentic and it feels mm -hmm. like I feel like the best way to for me is that porn seems like it's like an external mm -hmm. perspective and erotica mm -hmm. feels like it's an internal that then is expressed outwardly hmm. what was it like hearing to me as Diana for the first time I mean kind of it just I don't know I think to me makes my material better you know and that's Thank what you, you look for in a actor is just I think actors are I mean directors are constantly looking for other people to make them look better whether it's your production designer you know your actor your and cinematographer I think the same with same as same as an actor really? as well yeah. you know yeah. but you know there is an interesting thing in the learning curve though of the different medium that I was just talking mm. to Shauna about um, earlier today as I've been hearing the mixes and hearing in my own performance I feel like I'm also learning that there's subtleties that you can um, have on camera where your voice and face are communicating something very different. Whereas in a podcast, you know, you don't have that luxury. And so there's certain mm -hmm. things that need to be a little more literal mm -hmm. to kind of communicate differences that I'm noticing. And again, this is just a subtlety 
that's that I um which also just makes this really an interesting. It's like I'm I'm so excited to have opened up just to a, another medium to explore in storytelling. And um I you know there aren't as many of the narrative podcasts um so this is it's just interesting new territory. What's it like doing a sex scene, obviously, when you do a sex scene on set, you know, the closed set, but there's still people watching. Yeah. Now you're sort of, yes, people are watching because you're on Zoom, but it's a, obviously it's not um, physical. Um, it's still awkward. Part? It's still awkward. <laughs> <laughs> it still feels a little bit embarrassing, um, a little bit, you know, um, but because you can close your eyes and you can, you know, and again, I, I still have not had to step up to do, you know, a fantasy, that part of right. it. Um, but I did have a scene um, with uh, Oliver, the, the, my husband, the character of my husband in this. Um, and it definitely, you know, you, you feel like you're being watched. <laughs> well, it's so interesting because like even with, cause, so Clay Spang plays Oliver and it's very hard to, like they had a, they, you know, they have sex in one of the last episodes and you have to time it to the other person's sounds, right? So you're like, yes, you're that, kind of like pacing, all right, where are we right now? I guess that I'll follow was, it. That was difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I can't, we're not like, it's not like we're able to feel it. I'm just, we're just trying to go along. But are you make when you're when you're recording it, are you making the faces? Is everything, are you fully acting it? Yes, definitely. Wow. You are, definitely. In, in your carpeted bathroom? In my carpeted bathroom on a miniature sofa <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with my computer on a hat box mm -hmm. with a hand towel underneath it. Like wow. with <laughs> all my little weird things hidden in the wall <laughs> to make me laugh. Joan of Arc staring down at me, protecting me. Yeah, she was the other <laughs> cast member. I loved having her there. <laughs> Demi, you said that this this is out of your comfort zone when it comes to sexuality. But people think about you, striptease, just so many of your roles are about sexuality, about those relationships. How did you how did you how do you get past that? Are you able to put blinders on? How does it well, it? I mean, I think that is the the interesting thing, um, you know, in stepping in to tell stories and play characters that are opening you up to try on different things and to mm. and and in, you know, many cases to um, step out of your comfort zone. And sometimes the only way to do that is you you have to kind of push yourself um and uh, yeah, I mean, those things, like, I think it's interesting that I have pulled those types of projects towards myself. And I, and I think that it's not by accident. I think even unconsciously, there's things in an effort to um, be more accepting of mm -hmm. myself and, and get to know myself better. And in that case, I, you know, it's like a safe way of exploring mm -hmm. and 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 in this i know, i also know um that what i'm experiencing in my own discomfort or fear um is something that i want to change mm -hmm. because it's it's there out of a conditioning and the conditioning can't change until we until we change the narrative mm -hmm. and i you know and i think that we need it's it's something that we really need to do, and it if we want women to be, you know, if if, if we as women want to change um, uh, the 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 experience of being objectified, then we need to bring in another perspective. Mm. You also play a woman who likes her pills. You've been open about your sobriety. I'm actually two weeks ago. I celebrated seven years. So, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, was it uncomfortable doing those scenes? I think anytime you touch into a place that you know, 
um, it, it, it brings forward things that are very vulnerable. I think in the same way, this is such a vulnerable and I think a uh, story f- for you, Shauna, th- and I, but I, I feel like that, that's what resonated is, you know, again, um, let's, let's, let's remove the stigma around things. I mean, I, I understand this woman. I understand her need to self-medicate. I understand her, her, her sense of isolation, her, you know, desire to disconnect from that, which she's come from to, to create something that she feels is better and safer. Um, And, and, and yet the emptiness of not feeling whole. And I, and I, and I know that I'm not alone in that. Mm -hmm. And so whatever discomfort, vulnerability I might experience, I know that it's worth it. Mm -hmm. It's the same, you know, as when I did uh, my book, I just, you know, you have to step into these uncharted territories um, if you really want to make an impact, have an impact that is honest and authentic. Shauna, is there ever a time when you're recording that you have to stop and you could tell your actors are like, you know what? I think they need a break right now from this. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if I ever got there, you know, when I was even talking to my agent initially about Demi Moore, I remember um, someone saying, oh, she would really respond to this kind of material. Um, And that was, that was kind of um, the same with our entire cast. It was all when we were going through cast lists and we were talking about who was going to do the fantasies, agents would constantly say, oh, you know who'd really respond to this? Lena Dunham. Oh, you know who'd really respond to this? Mackenzie Davis. Like they knew that about their clients, that they were really interested Mm -hmm. in telling these kind of sex positive stories. So just the rep, your reputation and other actors' reputations made it. But what's interesting though is actors that responded to the material, Mm -hmm. but are in current situations that they felt could put it at risk. Mm -hmm. And which, uh, and I thought, I can't think of any man out off the top of my head who would have to n- negotiate something th- that w- would be putting their job at risk if it were exploring uh, a male sexuality. Yes, there were definitely actresses that were interested in the material and we had conversations with that ultimately said, I'm afraid it might affect my relationship with this studio or with yeah. this sponsorship or what, whatever they were doing, you know, or my brand and ultimately or my had, husband or my, yeah, or my husband's brand. Um, but ultimately yeah. had to, um, back out. I mean, look at, look at to me, you did strip tease. I mean, I went to the premiere. I was at the premiere of that <laughs> in New York, but that, I mean, that was, that was a moment that was like, this is this huge movie star. She's doing this movie. Like if a guy did it, we didn't have been mm-hmm. as such a monumental moment in Hollywood. Yeah, like that, you know, there's so many layers to that, you know, of 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 the judgment placed on that kind of that kind of woman. Right. And, you know, which was over which overshadowed why I found the story interesting in the first place, which is it was just about a mother trying to survive and uh, and not lose her daughter. That to me is what it, uh, it and 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 you know, um, and it came with a lot of judgment. And I faced then, a lot of judgment. And then you shaved your head, and that came with judgment because you were at the premiere with a shaved head. I was indeed. And even that was how could a woman shave her head for a role? Well, I I, I talk about it, you know, uh, or have spoken about it before and, and, and somewhat in my book that, you know, for me, those two films seem to represent one was a betrayal to women and one was a betrayal to men. Mm-hmm. And um, I think stepping into striptease, I kind of stepped into a role that was, you know, women's fear. Mm-hmm. And the other was as if it was a challenge to men. 
And um, yeah, and I, I, they let me know too. <laughs> and, and, and in particular, uh, you know, the, my salary uh, became, you know, um, something that I got punished for as opposed to celebrated. Um, but, you know, uh, everything is serving the whole, you know, and mm-hmm. it comes back around to be able to be seen now for what that is. And because of that, we have an opportunity to redirect and change that. I, it's taken I, a bit, but that's okay. It takes what I, it takes. What, what, when you look at what's going on now, when you look at the Me Too era, uh, you know, representation, diversity, did you ever think we'd get here? I mean, I think, I guess you just always hope so. You always, you know, and um, I think I sit thinking it's 2020. How can some of these still be conversations? How, how is how is this still where it is? And to be honest, I'm shocked at some of the things that I have seen come forward of people's behaviors um, with these Karens and Kevins as they have been referred to. I'm, I, I literally, like, I'm, I have been shocked at the lack of humanity and I have been inspired by the enormous humanity. And that's, and that's where I like to live is in that place where there is, is such great movement towards inclusivity and, mm. um, and just the joys of our mutual humanity mm. are, you know, like we are divine beings having a human experience and, you know, uh, I just hope we can make some bigger strides sooner than later. Shona, what do you want women to learn from Dirty Diana? I think if I could have anything, I'd just like women to have conversations, you know, to be able to see sex as like a very normal, healthy part of their life and one that can be really embraced. Because I think the shame that I felt, it was almost like I didn't even want to ask any questions about it, you know? I had my first orgasm way too late in life. And, you know, my mother never had that conversation with me. And I think so much, so much is focused on the male orgasm. We were just talking about like, you know, female, you know, wedding showers versus bachelor parties, you know, (laughs) even the games, the girls are all getting around, you know, playing games with bananas or, you know, reading about the hundred tips to please your man or even taking a, or tell them about the class. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was, you know, 21, flipping through the pages of the learning annex because I was so broke, but I still wanted to like take classes. And there's the class, like how to give the best head, you know, we'll teach you in six weeks. And I'm like, there's, there's not an equivalent class for men. Men aren't signing up for this class on learning how to please a woman. It's just why and why not? Why aren't men's magazines offering these lists of all these things we have to do with bananas to try and please our man? You know, it just becomes this overwhelming emphasis on the male orgasm. And in my 20s, when I was dating, that's what I thought a good successful date was, you know, or a successful sexual experience was if he climaxed and had a great time and my own pleasure was an afterthought and I, I want to open up the conversations Mm -hmm. and I want women to have these conversations that um, lead us in a different way because I can't. And once again, like you just said, it's 2020. I can't believe we're just having these conversations (laughs) now. I mean, people have been having them for a long time, but let's like continue to do it. Right. But if we don't encourage getting to know your body and how it works and equally, you know, I, I how both sides work. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, mm-hmm. then, then you know, there, then there, there's going to automatically be a disconnect. And mm-hmm. so, the, you know, I, I, there's that whole group of uh, of people that want to encourage abstinence as if that is the answer, and um, as opposed to education, mm-hmm. education, and you know. Um, doesn't doesn't mean you know you're encouraging reckless indiscriminate behavior 
Do you walk around Idaho talking like this? I walk around everywhere talking <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you want men to get from it? From Dirty Diana. I think for them to feel more comfortable by having more awareness uh, of, of, of what pleases a woman, what they're interested in. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's equally difficult for, you know, men, you know, to know how to engage if they're in the dark, mm. you know? So it's also a comfort zone for them. I mean, I've always said men figure it out for themselves and they know how they work, but what helps them to know how a woman works? Yeah. And, I mean, and we helps. don't know. We need a little help learning yeah. how to finesse that uh, as well. And to be emboldened to say that. I mean, how many times you're like, that's fine. Okay, sure. That's good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you're not really giving the whole truth. Um, but, and I would love more than anything, you know, this is kind of the show that I craved in the darkest days of my marriage. Like, is there something that you can listen to that can help elicit a connection that can get those juices flowing that might, you know, get you to have great sex that night. You know, who knows if I would love it if this show was that for someone. So during the pandemic, it seems even more important because we've definitely heard pandemic stories where people are like, I'm not having sex. It's the pandemic. I'm at home with, you know, my husband, my girlfriend, my wife 24 seven. It's not happening. It's sort of, yeah. again, here comes, the, here comes the pun. It comes at the perfect time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this pandemic is lonely. It's really lonely and it's really yeah. isolating. And it, you know, look, at the end of the day, sex is a great way to feel connected to someone and to know that you're not going through this alone. Sex is normal. Come on. It's just normal. Like, it is. This shit. I mean, my husband, he is, you know, Mexican, was raised very Catholic. I'm a liberal Jew from New York, so it's a whole different story. But I've learned a lot about that. I didn't know about mm -hmm. that whole psychology when it comes mm -hmm. to God's looking down on you and you're going to burn in hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you grow up to have a healthy sex life if that's what you've been taught as a child? Exactly. Or just there's two kinds of women. You're either a slut or you're a good girl. And right. every time you have a, a fantasy or you're thinking about what your boyfriend looks like or your girlfriend looks like without any clothes, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to get too far into that slut territory. You know, you're constantly checking yourself and your reputation as a young girl and just reading all the signs around you. You know, even when you're waiting at the bus stop. And I touch on this a little bit in my movie, Run, Sweetheart, Run. We had a lot of fun with the ads, but you're waiting at a bus stop and behind you is a sign of a woman giving a sandwich a blowjob. And you're like, and it, you know, the tagline is like, it'll blow you away or whatever it is. And you're like, why is this allowed? This doesn't feel like it should be allowed, right? But once again, the focus on the male orgasm is everywhere. I but mean, you know, of... but, but it's important that, and I think it, that it, this not be seen as any againstness. Yeah, no. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's not right. like, it's not a, a, against, it's just the like acceptance of that's how it's been, but how can we be part of changing and expanding? Expanding, To, yes. to something that is like just deepening our understanding, our awareness, the possibilities, mm -hmm. and mainly also our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can really say, like, I feel like if I had been encouraged to know how my body worked, to understand what an orgasm is, that that's a part of the, you know, you know the, the mutual exchange in a relationship, I think mm -hmm. that I also would have been less vulnerable to be, to being taken advantage of as a young woman. Right. Not the opposite. You would have been more empowered. You would have. Completely. Yeah, I would have known if I was being mistreated. Yes, yes, if I if I understood what the you know what that um, shared experience was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When when did you realize that those moments weren't right, or do you know it in the moment and you're sort of convince yourself, well, this must be right if it's happening. I I think what happens is 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 that you it doesn't feel right, but somehow you're conditioned to feel obligated mm -hmm. mm. and that and so you just don't or 
you you don't want to say anything. You just want to get it over with mm -hmm. and get out. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's a it's everything about it, like it is kind of geared to silencing you. Mm. And so that and look, it has changed, but it it just the mere just the fact that this is has such you know buzz about it being what it is tells right. you what we yeah. why we need to do things in this in this area so how unsafe did you feel coming to hollywood so young i mean i i i i don't know because i just you know when you're in it you're just in it i can only look at things in hindsight and know right. when you're in it it's just you're making your best navigating mm -hmm. So fun questions for you. Shauna, what are you binging right now? Oh, I'm binging um, Pen15. So you good. Watch? It's so good. Oh, God, I'm so excited because so I good. was looking. Okay. I'm, I'm, because I, you've now mentioned it a few times. So <laughs> it's on my list. It just makes me feel so good. I'm so grateful that it's out there. I'm a little late to the party. But I just mm -hmm. feel so acknowledged as a woman when I watch it. And it's just, it's so funny. The performances are, are insane. I'm loving it right now. What are you binging to me? So I just polished off actually Lennox Hill. Oh, okay. So you like um, a little reality. But only if it's got some, like, I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not like, I, I can't do other types of reality. But um, this, I really uh, am excited for i and my other reality that i want to i know there's an updated forensic files that's one of my other ones that i love really? um yes <laughs> but oh, so i haven't ha you'll probably be watching unsolved mysteries too i'm assuming the new version. i i'm sure i love a good <laughs> crime i love a you know like true crime um but i you know i've been actually had so much work going on. I ha I haven't had any like viewing time. That's great. I literally haven't. Um, but I love I love something good to get like really sucked into. Shauna, will we ever see a country strong sequel? Oh, you will. You will. Really? Tell me. I'm tell writing me, it right me. now. Are you really? <gasps> Called Heartland. I'm <gasps> writing it right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's it's. it's it's not a direct sequel, but it's like the next step in Country Strong. Yeah, I loved making that movie. It was such oh, an amazing so experience. Good. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So is Gwyneth going to reappear? I mean, Gwyneth is like a a mogul now. I mean, <laughs> like if like if she has what window to yeah, do it I in. Know. <laughs> It'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much. I really, Thank really you. appreciate it. This was great. Congratulations. I can't Thank wait to you. hear more. Like I said, they sent me the scripts and I started skimming them and I was like, no. I, like, and then I'm trying to hear your voice, say the lines. And um, it's really, it's really great. And it's definitely going to be a good limit, least limited series. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Um, great. All right. Have a great weekend. You Take too. Care. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. -bye.